Someone you haven't had a chance to say hi to, or remind them that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. such a uh, wonderful time having them here, so uh, it's always good to see Meg and her family and, and uh, to hear about the things that are going on with her ministry over in Hungary, and uh, certainly we're thankful that they made it safely back home. Uh, any other uh, praises? Pastor Steve. I praise God that he's still faithful and walking with us, and he never leaves us. Amen. 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 You are an inspiration to us, Pastor Steve. Amen. Any other praises this morning? Oh, Bart. Oh, sorry, Bart. The second. I praise God. Roger and Sam, they got the link to get my head to the wheelchair. 
Absolutely. The trustees are certainly the unsung heroes of our church. So true. They, they certainly are. So we, we're definitely thankful. Uh, so uh, for those that, that may not have known our, our lift over here, um, uh, we weren't sure that Pastor Steve's new uh, uh, wheelchair would be able to make it up. And so he's had to uh, come over. Okay, and it would. So, uh, so anyway, he's had to use his old scooter, which is not as comfortable and easy to get around with uh, for the past few weeks. And so uh, they were able to make some adjustments to be able to, to get Pastor Steve up here in his new chair. So now he can enjoy worship comfortably, or a little more comfortably. So definitely a, a big praise uh, to God for that, and, and certainly thankful for those that were able to make that happen. So, Mr. Bart, good to see you here today, sir. All right. Yeah. We, we, we are very glad to have you here. Oh, Cheryl. Um, I had shared a few weeks ago. I, I think that my my dad had been to the ER and was in AFib. He's he's 85. Most of you know who he is. Uh, he saw a cardiologist, and the cardiologist said he's not a typical 85-year-old at all, and we already knew that. But he did a procedure this week to check for blood clots, and praise God, it was all clear. And so tomorrow he has a procedure to shock his heart back into rhythm. It's a cardio version to shock his heart back into rhythm. So that's a prayer request you see from house. So. <laughs> uh, I'm just write that down. All right, thank you for sharing. Cheryl. All right. Any other praises this morning? Yes. My, my daughter-in-law, Patty, uh, had surgery and uh, came back to be numb. So oh, yeah. Thanks, Lord. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. God is good. God is good. God is good. So it's fun to see God working in our lives and the way that he answers prayer. And, and it's good for us to acknowledge that and, and to praise him. Um, I was reading in the Psalms this week, and I, I came across uh, Psalm 96, and it says, For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. He is awesome above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Might and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name and bring offering and enter his courts. And it's interesting, the word awesome um, was first used almost 500 years ago. And it's meant to describe something that is awe-inspiring, something that is tremendous, something that is otherworldly, something that brings us wonder and awe. And that's how we describe who God is. And that's the, the feelings, the, the emotion that we bring uh, as we come before God to be awe at the awesomeness of God. So let us uh, meditate on that as we prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs>
only to me the consolation. Show us your ways, O Lord, teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth, for you are our God, the Savior. Our hope is only in you. Good and upright are you, Lord. Direct us in what is right for the sake of your name. You, O Lord, are loving and faithful for those who keep your commands. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Veronica. Good morning. It may surprise you to know that those that are in power all over don't always keep their word and are sometimes untruthful. But we know that God's promises always stand and we can always stand on them. So let's sing this morning. <laughs> to people? What do you think, Zach? When we send a thank you card. Or maybe something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we say thank you, when we say please, do you say please and thank you? Do you say sure? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sure. Well, please and thank you is a very respectful way to appreciate people. 
when they need something in high school. So when they want something, like please may I have the mashed potatoes or something like that. Well, I'm going to tell you a Bible story about ten lepers. Do you know what a leper is? Uh, Lepers. 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 Leprosy. Do you know what leprosy is? Okay. It's a disease, and it's highly contagious. And back in Bible times, people that, well, that's a good example, yeah, that had leprosy um, had sores all over their body. And people didn't want to be around them. They usually wrapped their sores up so people couldn't see them. Well, there was 10 guys, Jesus is walking through this town, and there was 10 guys sitting back there standing up there, and they knew who Jesus was, and they said, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus told them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. So they started walking to the priest, and as they were walking, they noticed their, their swords were going away. Then Jesus healed them, all ten of them. He healed them. They're running through the streets, whooping and hollering, and praising and saying how wonderful it was. They were cured. One guy, one guy out of the ten came up to Jesus and dropped to his feet and said, Thank you, Master. And Jesus said, There were ten of you. Where are the other nine? That's how often we remember to say thank you. One guy out of ten remembered to say thank you. So we need to remember to say please and thank you. Bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, please answer when we call. Give us relief from our troubles and have mercy upon us in our time of need. We give thanks with all our heart in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. For those of you that may not have caught it when she was asking uh, about leprosy, uh, Zachariah answered, it's an animal. I thought she was saying a leopard. A leopard does have spots. All right. All right. Now we have our uh, uh, pastoral prayer where we have an opportunity to pray for each other and concerns. Um, let's continue to uh, keep David and Sandy Newman in our prayers. Um, David, uh, especially, still dealing with health issues. Uh, Adrian, uh, we want to continue to remember her in prayer and Nancy as well. Um, and then we have a, a request. Uh, uh, Cheryl mentioned earlier about her dad. Uh, we someone's asking for prayer for David Hooper. Oh, no, I guess that is. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I didn't read the bottom. So, and then uh, Todd mentioned that he had a new job, so he's thankful for that, but continue to pray uh, for him. Um, are there any other prayer requests this morning? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, Mariah had to take Oliver to the emergency room. He was, it was an emergency, but uh, at, at, on a Sunday night, there's really nowhere else to go. So anyway, Oliver has bronchitis. And so uh, if we could remember him in prayer, he's already feeling better. They gave him some medicine last night, so he's already doing better. But if we can remember him, that would be great. <coughs> Any other uh, requests this morning? Cindy. We still haven't heard from the ambassador still. of the Philippines. Oh, wow. Yeah. Bill and I are going to go to a representative's office this week and see. Okay. So, sure. Next step. And I, I'm sorry, your, your son's name again? Brad. Brad, okay. And his wife is mm -hmm. Nina, Filipino. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Let's remember Phil Rand 
in our prayers, uh, um, struggling with cancer. Thank you. There. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, our neighbor girl, Ellie, the three-year-old, um, she's doing fairly well. They've taken her off and she's taken most of the tubes out, and she's doing, she seems to be coming along. So the prayers are helping her. Okay. And the family has thanked us all for praying for her. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, let's continue to pray for Ellie. She's the three-year-old um, who are the neighbors with Karen and, and uh, Larry, uh, who had a heart transplant. So she's doing well, uh, but continue to pray uh, for her. Uh, any other requests this morning? Todd. I want to pray for you, Pastor Ron. <clears throat> All right. You are awesome. That word you gave out earlier. And also, Pastor Steve. All right. Judy. I have a very important job. Pray for Judy. That's right. I'm going to decide whether they're going to be a bypass or not. I'm not worried. I'll be there. All right. Yeah, but glad. It's great to hear that, Judy. Let's uh, continue to pray for Judy. She um, is going in for a consult this week to see if she can have surgery for a bypass. Um, so let's uh, keep her in prayer. Uh, any other requests? Well, if not, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Great and glorious God, uh, we are in awe at your majesty, and we sing of your mighty works. Father, as we are moved by the Holy Spirit, we praise you for being our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We give thanks to you, God, because you are so good to us. Your faithfulness and love endures forever. With joy, we give you honor and praise this day. Father, as the body of Christ, we come humbly before you, acknowledging that we have not always walked in your ways. We pray together in earnest repentance. We are aware that our transgressions towards you and towards each other, and we seek your forgiveness and your mercy. With hearts that are penitent and contrite, we seek to be restored into a right relationship with you. Father, we lift up to you <clears throat> our prayers of thanks for answered prayer how we have seen you work such marvelous ways in our life this week. Ways that you have answered prayers even before we thought to pray for them. Father, we also raise up our, our prayers of concern. There are those in our life and even ourselves um, that have been stricken by illness, or difficult times. Father, we plead for your divine healing and your comfort to pour down upon them. In moments of challenges with health, we pray for those that their faith would remain unbroken. We pray that you would keep them from any doubt or fear that may cloud their faith. With your love surrounding them, Lord, may they feel encouragement and strength. Fill their hearts and renew their souls. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring a complete healing to their bodies and a swift recovery from their illness. Father, we, we think of David and Sandy we think of Stephen Lynn. We think of Adrian and Nancy. We think of John and, and Ellie. We think of Brad and, and David. And all those that are on our hearts that have not been spoken. Father, you know their specific needs. And we thank you that you've already been working in their lives even before we've 
We pray that the power of your spirit and your healing would be upon them. Father, we thank you for the doctors and nurses who work tirelessly to care for those who are suffering. Give them wisdom and discernment as they treat and diagnose those that are in their care. Father, we thank you for the medicines and treatments that are used to help treat and cure those illnesses. And we ask that they would be effective and bring healing to those who need it. Father, as we read your word, it reminds us that you are the God of all comfort. You are the one who heals the broken and binds up their wounds. And we lift up to you those whose lives have been shattered by grief and loss, those that are struggling with addictions or, or mental illness. We pray for you to comfort them, that trusting in you, that they would wrap their loving arms around you, and that that would bring solace to their aching hearts. Father, we pray that they would find those to help them and support them through their difficult times, that, that they would surround themselves with positive influences. Father, there is so much brokenness in this world. We lift up those struggling with difficult relationships, families that are broken, marriages that are torn or suffering. Father, we pray that they would find reconciliation and healing through you, that there would be forgiveness where there needs to be forgiveness. Father, we thank you for using us for giving us your spirit to minister in your name. <clears throat> Lord, we pray that your spirit would shine brightly through us in the things that we say and do, not because of anything that we do on our own, but because of you. And we pray that others would come to see your love, your grace, and your compassion through the way that you speak and treat other people. So, Father, this morning as we open up your word and look deep into your teachings, we, we ask that your spirit would speak to each of us, that we would be attentive to hear what you have to teach us, that our spirit would be challenged and changed so that we can live each day walking deeper in our, deeper in our faith in you. So, Lord, may your spirit speak to us with power and in boldness today. We lift this to you in the name of Jesus, our powerful Savior. Amen. <laughs> Revelation that he saw throngs of angels before the throne of God singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, over and over and over again. And this morning we have the opportunity to join in with the angels, giving praise and adoration to our Almighty God, Savior, Father, and Creator. So let's sing and lift up our praises to Him.
um, exposed to COVID, but she is not sick at, the, at this time, so we want to remember her. Uh, so I'll be reading from the book of John 18 and also John 8. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. And then from John 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thank you, Cheryl, for pinch hitting for us today. Forgot to get a, you know, I have it sitting right here, but it's a blind spot. Uh, so sermon and a half for next week. Uh, the woman at the well. John 4. All right. All right. Well, that'll be fun. You guys have challenged me. This has been fun. This has been fun. Uh, all right, well, let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word and for the promise of your truth and the freedom that it holds. As we study your word, we pray that we would open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. Help us to understand your word, to apply it to our lives, and to experience the freedom that comes in knowing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We, we live in a time where the concept of truth is decaying. It's as if we're standing on a beach watching the waves slowly wash the sand beneath our feet. The solid ground of truth, once so strong and reliable, is being replaced by shifting sands, making it uncertain landscape. This hasn't been a dramatic change or, or something that's suddenly just happened. It's been a slow, gradual process. The erosion of truth is evident in many aspects of, of our life. We see it in, in media where sensationalism often trumps accuracy and where the line between news and entertainment is increasingly blurred. We see it in politics when, where there is spin and manipulation instead of honest debate and where the pursuit of power takes precedent over common, the common good. We also see it in our education system we, where the objective pursuit of knowledge is often replaced by subjective interpretations and where the value of critical thinking is undermined. In the shifting landscape, the concept of truth is often dismissed as outdated or even intolerant. The idea that there are certain truths that are universal, that apply to all people at all times is often met with skepticism and even scorn. Instead, truth is seen as relative, as something that can be molded and shaped into what you want it to be, your personal preferences and uh, cultural biases. We often hear phrases like your truth and my truth. It's as if truth is what we want to make it to be and something that can vary from person to person. But is this really the case? Can, can truth really be relative? Well, the simple answer is no. Truth by its own definition is something that is absolute. It's unchanging. It's impossible to have two opposite things, two opposing things to be true at the same time. Each person can have their own opinions or suppositions, or ideas, or suggestions, or perceptions, 
But that's all they are. It's not truth. Truth is not influenced by our feelings or our circumstances or our personal biases. And truth really doesn't care if you believe in it or not. Um, you know, I can, I can say that I, I don't believe in gravity, but whether um, I want to believe that gravity exists doesn't make it true. I'm still stuck to the ground. How we feel, what we think, and how we identify is not truth. Abraham Lincoln was once uh, in a conversation with a rather disagreeable person. And to prove his point, Lincoln uh, said to him that, well, how many legs does a cow have? Well, four, of course, came the disgusted reply. That's right, Lincoln said. Now, suppose that you call a cow's tail a leg. Now, how many legs would a cow have? Why, five, of course, came, came the reply indignantly. And Lincoln said, now, this is where you're wrong. <clears throat> the truth is that calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. And that's the kind of thinking that we have today. The decay of truth in our society is a serious issue. And it, it has even infiltrated the church. There are an alarming number of Christians who believe that truth is relative, that each person um, can find their own truth in their own way. But is that really biblical? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So the first obvious question is, well, what is truth? And how can we know what truth is? In our passage today, Pilate even asked the same question that has confounded many people over the centuries. And here's what the, the Bible teaches, that God is our creator, and truth exists because he created it. Without God, there is no truth. Truth means that there is nothing apart from God. It can't be explained by God. Philosophers have tried to do that for centuries. And since God alone is the creator of all things, God alone is the creator of truth. And the whole concept of truth falls apart if you remove God from the center. Without God, we will simply define truth as whatever we want it to be. What we'll see is, is it, what I see will be truth as I see it, and what you see as truth will only be as you see it. There could be no universal truth unless there is a universal truth creator at the center this must be there must be a source that is right and good for you to recognize what is right and good and be able to differentiate it from what is wrong and evil without this sort of rightness it's 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 all chaos it's all anarchy everybody just believe whatever you want and that's okay in fact, the widespread violence that we see in our society today is exactly what happens when people are lost and no longer hold on to the fact that absolute truth exists. The Bible teaches that <clears throat> truth isn't just an abstract idea or a philosophical puzzle. Instead, truth is a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He wasn't very ambiguous about this. He, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying that, that there is only one source of truth, and that's him. Why did he say this? Well, the apostle John uh, shares that with us at, at the beginning of uh, the gospel. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We see that his glory, the glory of the one and only 
who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the truth incarnate. Jesus is the truth in human form because he is God in human form. In Jesus, the truth came to earth to confront our lives, to transform our mind, to heal our hearts, to fill us with joy, and to liberate us from the slavery we have to deceit. We know what is true because we know Jesus. Now, this is a hard concept for many in our society today who would rather believe that truth can be molded and shaped and shifted to whatever they want it to be in order to satisfy their own desires, to justify their own actions, no matter how harmful or destructive they may be. But this is not the truth that Jesus is speaking of in our passage today. He says, if you hold on to my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, notice that he doesn't say that you will know your truth, or you won't know a truth, but you will know the truth. There is only one truth, and it can be found in the teachings of Jesus. Well, first, the teachings of Jesus are absolute. They're not subject to interpretation or personal bias. They are not influenced by fads and trends and, and uh, culture. They are the same yesterday and today and forever. This means that we can't shape the teachings of Jesus to fit our own desires. Instead, we must shape our lives to fit the teachings of Jesus. This is an important point here. If you don't remember anything else today in the, in the message, remember this. We cannot shape the teachings of Jesus to fit our own desires. Instead, we must shape our lives to fit the teachings of Jesus. And this shouldn't be a challenge, but a comfort. In a world that has shifting sands of changing opinions and uncertain future. The truth of Christ is like a rock, a solid foundation that we can stand and be secure. This truth is a light. It's a beacon that guides us through the darkness and a lamp that illuminates our path. Jesus goes on and talks about the importance of holding on to his teachings. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Now, when I read this part, I, I think of uh, when my kids were young and I uh, would hold their hands in a, in a parking lot and, and have a firm grip and a tight hold to make sure that they didn't run away into traffic and, and, and get hurt. We need to hold God's word tightly to us. We need to make it secure in our lives. Now, some translations will use the word abide, and the word abide means to stay or to dwell. It's not a fleeting visit or a casual acquaintance. It, it means a deep, enduring, intimate relationship. It's a surrender to his authority, his lordship, and his sovereignty. It's making a decision to let his word shape us and mold us and transform us. In order to hold on to or abide in Christ, it's not enough to just simply read the Bible or study his word. Knowing John 3, 16 and being able to recite the Lord's Prayer is not enough. We must live by it. It means living a life that is guided by the absolute truth of God's word. Following his teachings, even when it's difficult, even when it goes against the grain of society. This allows God's word to fill our minds, to direct our wills, 
and to transform our affections. In other words, our relationship with Christ is intimately connected on what we do with our Bibles. Do we hide it away on our shelves, letting it collect dust, or are we letting it make an impact on our lives, daily looking to it to find what God has to teach us? This means that as true disciples of Jesus that we will begin to know the truth, to hold on to it, and to live by it. That we're not swayed by the changing ideas of the culture or the shifting sands of public opinion. They are steadfast. We will be steadfast in our commitment to the truth and, and be willing to stand up for it even when it's unpopular. We'll continue to learn and to grow and to mature in our faith as we follow the teachings of Christ. The truth that Jesus speaks about here is not a relative truth that can be shaped and molded by our own desires. It is an absolute truth that is found only in Scripture. It can be inconvenient and make us feel uncomfortable, but it's a truth that will make us better than who we are and who God created us to be and will define us as disciples of Jesus. As we look back on verse 32, we see that Jesus says, the truth will set you free. Now, at this point in history, the Jews were under the rule of the Roman government. Even though Rome gave them an exceptional amount of autonomy, they were very aware of the Roman presence around them through soldiers and governors and appointed kings. So when Jesus said that the truth would set them free, he wasn't talking about a political freedom, even though there were some of his listeners that thought that's what he was talking about. And Jesus even tries to, to correct that way of thinking by telling us later in the text that very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Being a slave to sin is the ultimate bondage that we can experience. But the freedom that Jesus offers is a spiritual freedom from that bondage. It is a release from a lifestyle of habitual lawlessness. As we immerse ourselves into God's word, we come to understand that Jesus is the embodiment of truth. He has the power to liberate us from the shackles of sin. As we know, sin is a state of separation from God. It's a barrier that prevents us from experiencing the fullness of God's love and grace. But Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has broken that barrier. He's made a way for us to be reconciled with God and to have a right relationship with him. That's the freedom that Jesus offers. A freedom over the power and penalty of sin. And this freedom isn't something that we can earn or that we can achieve on our own. It's a gift that's freely given through Jesus Christ. We can't work our way to this freedom or uh, attain it through our own good deeds or our uh, uh, stars for uh, memorizing scripture or saying the Lord's Prayer. It's only by God's grace through Jesus Christ that we can experience this freedom. And as we continue to walk it with Jesus, and abide with his word, surrender to his lordship, we will experience a continual process of liberation and transformation. We are set free from the power of sin or progressively transformed into the likeness of Christ. It's a, not a freedom that we can just do whatever we want, but it's a freedom to live in accordance to God's word and a freedom to become who God created us 
to be. I think 1 Peter uh, 2.16 says it best. Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives so that they may live as people who are free. Not using their freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living as servants of God. The freedom of his love and forgiveness gives us peace as the shame and guilt of our past no longer has a hold on us. It gives us rest as we are able to lay down our worries, our burdens, our concerns. It frees us from the uncertainty and confusion that we have because we have his absolute and unchanging truth to hold on to. And it gives us a renewed strength as we are filled with the Holy Spirit. His com it is how comforting it is to know that we can have this freedom and that the world can't take it away from us or keep us from experiencing it. The philosopher Blase Pascal once observed, truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it. When we fall in love with Jesus and we are in relationship with him, we will love the truth and he will set us free. Now, many of you, uh, Zachariah loves playing with Play-Doh and uh, I'm sure many of you did too when you were younger. Well, um, as we come to the end of the message, I, I was thinking about, about truth and in, uh, in our culture today, truth has kind of become like Play-Doh. It is moldable and, and shapeable, and you can make anything that you want with it. If you don't like it, you can just crumble it up and, and make something new. But then we have Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. That he is solid like a rock, unchanging, absolute, unmoving and gives us something secure and a foundation to stand on. And so we have, we, have a, a, we have a decision to make today, every day of our lives. Do we want to live in, in, uh, with, with the belief that truth is, is uncertain and, and changing, insecure, as uh, the Play-Doh is? Or do we want to stand on the solid rock of Christ, the absolute truth that he offers and the freedom that he gives? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the truth that it reveals. We thank you for being our rock, our fortress, and our anchor in the shifting sands of our culture. We ask for your help, Lord. We ask that you would help us to live out your truth in our daily lives. Father, strengthen us and fill us with your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.